I can ride a bike. I can go as far as I can. I'm gonna ride this 20 inch till it's till it's impossible to ride anymore. That's just it. And I don't really. I'm not concerned of how good I get or whatever. Just a, if I can do one little thing, that's enough for me. Just something to make me happy. And for me today, that's all that matters is how I feel inside. When did you start riding? <laughs> <laughs> ah. Started riding probably about eight years old. You know, I used to go surf and stuff too, but I really got into bikes. I took it and considered myself a freestyler from the way back days. By the time I was 10, 1980, uh, seen a picture of a, a quarter pipe in the magazine and uh, asked my father to help me build it and uh, he wouldn't. So I went and stole all the wood and everything it took and I built that quarter pipe all by myself. I started riding flatland, you know, at the same time, and I really loved it the most. It was just a new era, you know, the early 80s, you know, everything was taking off, you know. I started riding in the 70s, but, you know, the 80s kicked off, and, you know, it was a new freestyle was born. I was in Florida at the time, and all the magazines were in California. Well, we got to look at the magazines, and it was something to hold our standards to. For me, the local scene was great. We probably had, they had a group on one side of town that rode, and we would consider them the goody two-shoe guys because us, we were just partiers, smoking weed, and, you know, whatever, and just riding. But if I look back on it now, you know, my little town, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, okay, we had a professional BMX rider, Bill Madden. You know, he wasn't the top big name, but he's a racer. He did his thing. Bruce King, one of the flat, flatland legends from way back in the day, invented the Undertaker. Chris Rothrock got sponsored by General Bicycles. I was there at the competition when R.L. Osborne asked him to join the team. You know, this is all from the town I grew up in. At that time, you know, everybody did one little trick and rode around and did another little trick. And, they weren't linking tricks, and we started linking tricks, you know, before our time, you know, before the media time. Before a decade was in a magazine, I've already did it, you know. I can't say I invented the trick, because who knows at that time. My first competition was at the Yamaha shop in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. I think I was probably, I'm not sure, the year 13 or 14. I had to go first. And I remember when I rode, the, the crowd was in awe. The announcer couldn't announce the tricks I was doing. The other riders didn't even want to ride after me because they, there was no you know, competition there. But like the thing, eventually riding got bigger, they got better, and everybody helped each other. If you look back on it, you know, that's how freestyle invented. You know, one person would do something, somebody else would add to it, and somebody else will add to that, and then all of a sudden you got this run that's amazing. You know, that freestyle was new and it was growing. I continued to do all kinds of drugs, LSD, marijuana. You know, I used to just be a partier, you know. And I could notice that the other kids on the other side weren't really into all that. So that's why we kind of were a separate crowd. Um, 1987, I'm pretty sure it was an AFA contest in Dothan, Alabama. Chris Rothrock actually invited me to go with him because it, it, to go up there, I got a ride with him. It was my first big contest. Um, I think there was like 33 riders in my class. I got third place. I put a foot down in my run, but I'm still stoked on my run. It was a real good run, um, you know. But that was not the the highlight of the event. Is the competition for me is when I got there and got out of the van and I seen all the people I looked up to in the magazines, you know, it was Dennis McCoy, Martin, you know, just all the big names, R.L. Osborne, Diz was there. It was just an amazing ride. You know, I had all these pros that, you know, I were like my heroes, you know, and they just stopped and watched, you know. A few months later, when I went to my next contest in West Palm Beach, you could see a group of riders adding some of my style to their style and it was all good because I was using some of their style to my style to make everybody's style look good. Everybody was, the sport was growing rapidly and it was 
all part of everybody contributing. From then on, you know, I just kept riding and stuff, and it, it was my life, you know, it was BMX, freestyle, that was the stuff. I can remember going to the prom with my girlfriend, and you could see our tire tracks on the wall. And that's, that's around the time, you know, Dave Volker came in the scene, and the street riding really took off. But all of a sudden, you know, my using and drinking kind of took over and it, it just got me further away from my bicycle. Really, when BMX died, I didn't have a clue. I left the scene that rapidly that I didn't even have a clue that the sport I love was dying all over. Go to work, party. No time for riding bikes no more. I let my dream die. One day I just decided, it was uh, November 6, 2011, the day before I had to report to pro probation, you know, I, I, I purposely got drunk and, and did cocaine and violated probation. And, you know, I look back on that and that was one of the best decisions I ever made because, you know, I went to prison, they flew me back to Arizona to go to prison. Um, I got out of prison. They said, hey, you got to go to these meetings. You know, you got to go to AA and, you know, get this paper signed. My first meeting, you know, I, I sat there and I said out loud that I was an alcoholic and addict and I got honest with myself. And, uh, you know, from there my mind opened and uh, I was ready to change. You know, that's the desperation that I got is to change. I got clean and sober and my dreams came back alive. I mean, totally enjoy riding. I mean, it's like the best thing I have going today. I have to put my sobriety first because without that, you know, my dreams die again. You know, I can't, I won't be able to ride. And, and that's just a fact for me. I came up to a park and I could see it out in the distance. I seen a flatlander, a kid named Matt. And that was cool because I finally had somebody to ride with. Just meeting from that one instant, you know, I got to meet all kinds of other riders here in Tucson. And, uh, they, you know, they asked me to go to a thing called the Tangent Jam, you know. I ended up, that was 27 years, I think, if I do the math right, since my last competition. I was the oldest rider there. And, you know... That was a good feeling that I could, you know, at least hang with some of these riders today a little bit and hold my own, you know. I got second place in that. and That was the best feeling I had in a long time is, you know, be recognized as a rider, you know, that I can still do this, you know. And it's not really the fact that I want to be recognized. It's pretty much how it makes me feel that I still can ride and at a good level. And, uh... You know, if I never enter a competition again, that's fine. But I'll tell you, I'll still ride and enjoy what I do as long as my body will hold up, you know. I'm trying to learn, you know, to ride these newer tricks, which these rolling tricks are difficult. And I, it's kind of goes against my instincts, but quitting drinking and using was against my instincts, too. So. You know, I can do it and just, you know, if I have anything to say is if you're a young rider and you, you know, you might drink a beer or you might smoke a joint or you never know what you're doing, it might never affect you in the way it affected me, but there's a possibility it could and uh, you could lose your dreams. And that's kind of why I want to do this because I like to see riders, you know, sell and do the best they can. Hi, I'm Gary. I'm an alcoholic and an addict, and I'm a BMX freestyler. Never let anything get in the way of your dreams.